The damaging effects of sleep apnea and improper breathing can really be prevented, especially if addressed at an early age. So childhood. I see so many kids in my practice, and a lot of them have some sort of breathing issue. So a lot of them have very obvious airway issues, and and a lot of these signs are things that dentists will look for that relate to the breathing that a lot of people probably won't even think about. So a lot of them have these very narrow, constricted jaws, and that's related to mouth breathing. Also crooked teeth, people taking wheezing breaths, only using their upper chest to breathe, so never engaging their diaphragm. And when they're at rest or when they're walking over to the room, their mouth is open, so I can tell that they're mouth breathing. And also seeing teeth grinding, so people wearing their teeth away, and large tonsils and adenoids, and a lot of kids needing to get those removed. These are all signs that a child has mouth breathing syndrome. And we have countless evidence that breathing through your mouth instead of your nose, especially at an early age, will cause all sorts of issues including skeletal deformities, which includes constricted jaws and narrowing of the airways, and also all of the dental problems that I mentioned above. Now, what we've also seen is that this improper breathing can also contribute to sleep apnea and also all of the diseases associated with sleep apnea. And it does this through oxidative stress because simply not being able to breathe through your nose or having nasal obstruction will create the same amount of oxidative stress in your body. And this will cause the same diseases that we associate with sleep apnea. So if you're trying to correct a child's breathing, the first thing that you want to do is make sure that they have a breathing problem in the first place. So a simple way to do this is check them when they're resting. So next time they're watching TV or sleeping or reading something or doing something like playing a game Just see their lips, and if their lips are opened, then they're probably breathing through their mouth, and that's a bad sign because now they're getting all the negative effects from mouth breathing. And also, when they're sleeping, you can check if they're grinding their teeth. That's also a really bad sign because that's associated with a lot of breathing problems. Because when kids grind in their sleep, it means that something is going on with their airway and something is going on with their breathing where they cannot breathe correctly. And that's a natural response that our body does when we cannot breathe correctly. Also, you can check if they're snoring. So if a child is snoring, that automatically means that some sort of obstruction is there in the airway. This is true whether they're breathing through their nose or if their mouth is open. Also check if they're waking up with drool everywhere or they have a super dry mouth. Also, those are signs of mouth breathing. If the kid has symptoms of ADHD or you're thinking of getting them tested for ADHD, You probably want to check their airway first because a lot of the same symptoms of mouth breathing are the same symptoms as ADHD. And it has to do with being chronically tired, which is another sign. So if the kid is chronically tired, they have those same symptoms and they show the same symptoms as people who have ADHD. Also, if they're bedwetting, it's a sign that they're not sleeping well and it has to do with the airway. If they're not breathing correctly, then they're more likely to wet the bed. And also if they have asthma or allergies, all of this stuff is related to improper breathing. Now you should definitely check with your doctor before trying this on a child, but I would not recommend taping a kid's mouth until they reach the age of five. Before that, I just think that they're too young. Now before you try taping a child's mouth shut, you wanna make sure that they can even breathe through their nose in the first place. So I talked earlier in this podcast about a nose unblocking exercise that you can try. And I'm putting a link to that specific part in the description below if you haven't seen it yet. So make sure you do that first if a child cannot breathe through their nose. And even if an adult is doing this, you want to do that first. So you want to start by placing the tape in 10-minute increments. So you want to do this when they're awake because you can watch them. And if they have trouble, again, make sure you try that nose unblocking exercise that I was talking about. Now, another good time to do this is when the kid is napping because, again, you can watch them, but now you can kind of test and see how they'll respond when they're sleeping. So if you do decide and you eventually decide to tape the child's mouth shut when they're sleeping, there's three rules I want you to follow. So the first is the child should choose where they want to sleep. You want to make sure that they're comfortable. They also choose who they get to sleep with because you don't want them to sleep alone when you're doing this. 
And the last thing is you have to tape your mouth shut too because this will prevent them from being scared of it. You don't want them to be scared to wear the tape. They'll be more comfortable if you wear it with them. Now, again, you don't want to jump to taping their mouth shut at nighttime right away because you want to make sure that they can even handle it in the first place. You want to make sure that they can breathe through their nose in the first place. And if they cannot breathe through their nose, and even after you try that nose unblocking exercise I was talking about, this is time to go to an ENT or an allergist because either their allergies are so bad that it's preventing them from breathing through their nose or they have some sort of anatomy defect where it's preventing them from breathing through their nose. It's not normal. It's never normal if someone cannot breathe through their nose for an extended period of time because that's how we were supposed to be breathing and that's how all animals breathe. So it might take some time to getting used to, especially if they're not used to breathing through their nose. It might even take a couple weeks, but there is plenty of evidence that we were meant to breathe through their nose and that when we restore nasal breathing, that it can benefit us in so many ways and even prevent sleep apnea and other sleep disordered breathing issues. Now, one of the reasons our nose is so much better than our mouth is because our nose has this anatomy in it. So our nose has these hairs in it, and these hairs are what can kind of pick up dust and other particles, prevent it from any entering our lungs, which our mouth doesn't do. Actually, our mouth doesn't do any of the things I'm about to mention. Your nose also has mucus, and mucus is cool because it has these enzymes, and these enzymes in your mucus will kill 98 to 99 percent of viruses and bacteria. There's plenty of evidence that people who breathe through their nose more are way less likely to get sick, and this is why. Your nose also has turbinates, and these turbinates are what help temper the air and bring it to your body temperature and also humidify the air. Because instead, when you're breathing through your mouth and you have this cold, dry air entering your lungs, you're going to have way more inflammation in your lungs and everything's going to kind of constrict and it's just not going to be good for your lungs. You also have these paranasal sinuses when you breathe through your nose and as air enters through these sinuses, it produces a molecule called nitric oxide. Nitric oxide, I mentioned earlier in this podcast as well, it's a very powerful molecule because it's a vasodilator and it's also an antibacterial. So not only is it going to help us with our oxygen and our lungs exchanging air, it's also going to prevent us from getting sick. And this is one of the main reasons why so many people who are mouth breathers are more likely to have swollen tonsils and adenoids because they don't get the benefit of this nitric oxide and their whole upper airway area is not as clean and now their tonsils and adenoids are gonna be more likely to get infected. There are plenty of sleep studies done where people redo their sleep study with mouth tape on and they find that people's airway restriction was resolved by simply using mouth tape. They did the same thing with sleep apnea. There's plenty of studies that show that sleep apnea can be reduced or even cured by simply taping your mouth shut at night. And if you start correct breathing early enough, so when a person is a child, it can reinforce having good posture, help with jaw development, prevent serious breathing issues like sleep apnea, and even help the kid grow and reach their full potential. It might seem barbaric when you're taping a child's mouth shut and it might seem like you are doing some parental abuse, but really I think it's the opposite. If you let a kid keep breathing through their mouth and you know all the detrimental effects you get from mouth breathing and you continue to ignore it, that is more parental abuse than trying to prevent those issues. If you're ever working out in the gym, and you feel a muscle spasm or something like that, that means that your CO2 levels are too low. And that usually happens because you're breathing too quickly. And when you breathe too quickly, you expel that CO2 way too fast. 